Hello and welcome to another Out of Spec Reviews video. You join me in Monterey celebrating Car Week here at something called the Maserati House. Maserati's taking over this beautiful home to showcase some of their new models. And this being at least the most exciting to me, it is the first full electric Maserati. It's called the Gran Turismo Fulgore. And Fulgore means electric in the Maserati world. And I'll talk to you in this video about Maserati's electric plans. I'll take you on a full tour front to back, all the nerdy settings, all the electric stuff you guys are curious about because it's very impressive. This is the first electric vehicle in this sort of two plus two coupe category. We actually own, I would say, an older competitor to this vehicle. So I'll compare it to my Polestar 1, which is a plug-in hybrid in the same class as this car, actually. And uh, of course, we're going to get nerdy. So everything in this video is going to be about Maserati and electrification. I'll share my impressions, everything I'm hearing from the team, and uh, get ready to learn more about this car than you ever wanted to. <laughs> So this is the Maserati Gran Turismo Fulgore. And, and before I walk you through the whole model line, I just want to explain what Fulgore means. It means electric in Maserati speak. So Maserati is committed by basically 2030 to be fully electric and by 2025 to have a full battery electric version of each of their cars, which to me is really exciting because they also make the super cool MC20 and so that means we're going to have an electric sports car. This is an electric two-door sort of grand tour, two plus two. It's a little bit bigger. It's not supposed to be built for the track. It's a softer car. It still can do track stuff. Some of their B-roll photos and videos I've seen was this thing drifting around the track. It makes a ton of power. We'll talk about that, but that'll be amazing. Then there will also be a fully electric SUV coming from them and others. So Maserati and electric are coming together. Now, is that a good thing because everything about Maserati we've known in the past and maybe some of you are just getting into cars who are in the electric side but if you're a old school car enthusiast like I am I'm gonna miss the days of the old 4.7 liter V8 which is now out of production they've moved to some other things that that old Gran Turismo the previous generation of this car just sounded amazing it wasn't the most reliable it wasn't the fastest it wasn't the best handling didn't have the best transmission especially the early ones but the noise made that whole car. And it was truly some of the best audible experiences you could have behind the wheel. So are you missing out when it goes to electric? And the answer is we don't know because we haven't had a chance to drive it. We'll drive this towards the end of the year. But to me that I'm going in to be totally transparent with slight skepticism because Maserati's always been known about the experience. However, the specs on this car will truly blow you away, and I'll walk you through that front to back. So, um, Gran Turismo, this car, is uh, in its second generation now, or roughly third generation, because there have been some facelifts along the way. And you can choose when you order this car either to get a combustion one with a three liter twin turbo V6, and there's a couple different power output versions of those, or you can get the battery electric. And the battery electric is the top one, which I would not expect from Maserati. So if you want the fastest one, the best handling, the, the crazy drifty fun stuff, you go electric, which is pretty cool. And uh, again, the full Gora name indicating a full battery electric vehicle. In terms of powertrain, come on down here so I can show you some cool things about the car. I want to just explain how it's laid out. The chassis is pretty much the same combustion and electric, and the battery itself is about nine, mid 90 kilowatt hour use, uh, gross and about mid 80. So I think it's 98 kilowatt hour gross, 88 kilowatt hour usable, big buffers. Makes sense because a lot of owners are just gonna leave the cars full charge in the garage and you know Maseratis don't typically do huge mileage. So I agree with that decision. And the battery pack is in a T shape. So it actually runs down the middle of the car. I'll just show you in here really quick. Just had to unlock it. I have the key on me. If you look in here, you can see quite a big center console area that runs the length of the vehicle. And so that is one particular battery module. And then there's another battery module that sits about here that goes across. And so it actually has close to 50-50 weight distribution, which is interesting. Better weight distribution, uh, more, I should say, central weight distribution than the combustion one, which is like three or 4% more heavy in the front than the rear. So that's very interesting. Then you have three electric motors, it makes 570 kilowatt peak power output, which is 750, something like that. I'll leave the number there in horsepower. But if you actually add up what the motors are capable of, they're three 300 kilowatt 
permanent magnet motors. You have uh, two 300 kilowatt magnet, uh, permanent magnet motors on the rear and one up front hooked to an open differential. The two in the rear are not mechanically linked, so full variable torque vectoring, very similar to Model S Plaid, to our Polestar 1, and uh, things like that. So that's an interesting situation and layout. A lot of automakers seem to be honing in on this three motor, two in the rear, one in the front situation. But they can't output full power that all the motors are capable of. And the answer is, why? What are they leaving on the table? Now I've heard a couple different rumors that the battery may not be able to expand everything, or, or I should say, uh, you know, get all the power out at once because of connections or cooling, or I'm really not sure. I think it's actually detuned maybe because the MC20 is going to be insane and they're just going to use the same motor. So I would expect to see future versions turned up a little because the motors are almost underutilized in this car. The only time really a motor is going to get full power at once is if you're in a extreme situation. If you have a lot of yaw, a lot of turn in, for example, where you want to push the outside of the wheel. If you're turning left, you're going to push that outside rear right to max power it's possible, but either way, it seems like the motors are gonna be fairly understressed compared to what the battery can output. And then we get to some other crazy things about this car when it comes to the long distance ability. Now, this vehicle has not been rated in the EPA cycle yet. I am gonna open up the charging port for you. Again, this is actually one of their working mule prototypes, just opening it up here. If I open up the charging port, you can see this one's a Euro spec car. It's been like tested in the deserts and stuff, which is crazy. You can see the CCS port there. You actually have 22 kilowatt AC charging for the Euro cars. My guess is probably a 48 amp onboard charger in the US, but I'd like to see an 80 amp. It's not been confirmed what we're going to get, but um, it's a Maserati. It's going to be expensive. Put the biggest onboard charger you can in this thing just to get it juiced up. That would be great. But the DC fast charging capability, I'm just going to shut off the lights here because it's dinging at me a little bit. So I'll hit this. We'll go back to auto. Um, the DC fast charging capability is the real story. Hello, you join Future Kyle. I am just here to explain some DC fast charging stuff. Uh, the information I was given at the event was actually wrong. So I'm here to correct it in this little clip. Uh, the car they told me could DC fast charge at 400 kilowatts. And I'm like, no way, that's insane. It actually can't. It can charge at 400 kilowatts under regen, which is like regen matching the Hummer EV. But based off of all the articles and everything I'm seeing online, it looks like 270 kilowatt DC fast charging is what the car will ship with. Now that is similar to Taycan and it's no surprise because it uses the same cells as Taycan with a slightly larger battery pack. But um, yeah, doesn't DC fast charge at 400 kilowatts? There's no charger that could really do that right now anyway. Most of them will max out at 365 or so, uh, but still pretty, pretty amazing, 270 kilowatts, no complaints there. I think it'll be totally fine. Let's get back to the video. And there's actually an option in the car to do like a, a slower DC charge. I'll show you in the settings to preserve battery longevity or a super fast DC charge if you just wanna zap it up on a road trip. So maybe an ultimate cannonballing car? We'll have to see, could be really interesting. Uh, the whole battery architecture is an 800 volt system architecture, which there we go, just closing the port there, uh, which is great. I, I don't actually know nominal voltage or anything like that. I don't know if it's a high 800 or a, a mid 700 voltage range, but it is up there. And then I was just like, okay, Maserati, when I heard these things, I was like, Maserati did not phone in this car. They went, all out. They built themselves a powertrain fitting of the name, as, seemingly, and like it does some cool things. Now, again, the purpose of this car is as a two plus two, so full adults can sit in the back. They claim, I'll try that out, Grand Tour. And sorry for the keep making the car beep. Uh, that seems like a pretty good concept for a car. There's really nothing that's electric that comes close to this. Really, the one thing that does is our Polestar 1, which is a plug-in hybrid combustion vehicle. And I always say that car would be better if it was made fully electric. And well, this is kind of the same idea. Um, what it also can do, which I think is pretty neat, is like do some skid stuff around the track. Now, again, this car is not built for the track. They're not saying that this is a track weapon, but I watched some videos from Top Gear and Auto Car before I filmed this, and they were like 
full sideways, big skids in this thing. It just looked like an absolute blast. So I cannot wait to share that with you when we're able to go for a drive. It just seems like they've overbuilt this thing for future iterations and different platforms when they use this technology. That's enough on the exterior for now. This color is pretty special. I don't actually know what it's called. We'll, we'll maybe get into that a little bit later, but I wanna show you inside. So I'm gonna open up the passenger uh, door for you because I, I think it's a really beautiful interior. This new generation Maserati is gorgeous on the inside. There's this new uh, material that the, they're of course really talking about. It is optional and it is made of recycled fishing nets. Alyssa, what's your impression of this? I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I like it a lot, especially the color is just amazing. These, this design is just really neat and cool. And it actually does kind of let you know that it it, it looks fishnetty. Like it, it, I don't know, it's really pretty to me. It's a very technical yeah. uh, material through here. It looks really cool. It feels a little bit like the Land Rover Defender interior. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like it's like technical fiber. I don't know how else to describe it to you, but the cabin is a gorgeous cabin. Yeah, and absolutely I absolutely gorgeous. I, I have to be honest. I've never been a Maserati guy personally. No. This might be the first one to win me over. Really? Well, that's that's beautiful. This one might be. So I'm gonna pop in the driver's seat. You stay there. Let's go check it out on the inside. So in we go. Very similar entry point to the Polestar one, actually these huge doors, they're massive. And instantly I'm inside this car. Now this particular one, again, I said is a working prototype. It has 8,612 kilometers on it of like seemingly hard use. Oh yeah. And uh, so you can see the steering wheel is a little bit greasier than I would like. And seats too. Yeah, seats have been used, but hey, this is what they'll look like if you use them properly. What I, what I, find interesting before we go through the interior tour is is the existing Maserati customer base going to like this car and I think out of principle talking to some folks here the answer is no this is going to open up a new world a new future world of electric mobility or I should say customers to Maserati that are interested in electric mobility. That's just my impression looking in. Uh, turn signal stocks feel pretty good a little bit plasticky but uh, still quite nice infotainment layout looks good let's hit the start button which is this button on the wheel i have to say that start button that is cheap that's not a good start button mm, so maybe some of the stellantis nature is coming out here look at that it moves now again i do have to say this is a pre-production prototype model but it is following maserati's uh <laughs> heritage perform service is what it popped up and said so they said that this car is going to have some lights and stuff again it's not a series production model uh, at 54 percent state of charge it's predicting 153 kilometers i don't know how this car has been driven i assume very hard so let's not go uh based off of those numbers but that's not really instilling confidence so take a look here on the display i have a drive mode setting where i can go max range gt sport or Corsa mode. And that changes the full um, display here where you have a, a power output gauge, they call it thrust percentage. And I even have a history graph with temperatures. This is not, this is a temperature graph. So there's an optimal range of the temperature. Can you see that on the camera there? And then you can see it gets too hot or too cold. So right now we're at the minimal optimal temperature where we are. That is freaking cool. So. Again, they seem to get the electric thing. They understand what the limitations are. Whenever I start to see like temperature gauges in electric cars for motors and stuff like that, I'm like, okay, these guys kind of are understanding some things here. You can actually take a look. Well, I'll get into this in a second. Let's continue with the, the driver position. The seats feel awesome and I can get low, which is really cool because I, there's no battery underneath me. And that's one of the cool things about this car is most electric cars, I always feel like I'm sitting up way too high and I can't get low enough. And that's because the batteries are underneath you. But here are the batteries here and up front. I don't know how they fit a 100 kilowatt hour gross capacity battery pack in this thing with this huge, um, you know, center console. It almost seems like this is not enough space, but they did. So it's, you know, again, high 80 kilowatt hour usable. This isn't going to be the max range king, but you can go out, go for a blast in the canyon, zap it up real quick. That seems really cool. Steering wheel, perfect size, really nice in the hands. Lots of buttons and lots of plasticky buttons. Almost rattly, again, pre-production, but I guess this can go through some menus. 
Oh yeah, you can see torque split, front to rear. You have your power percentage, that's cool. Here's your layout of your motors. Three permanent magnet motors, again, no clutch disconnect, but it's not meant to be the range king. My guess is somewhere around 250 mile EPA range, similar to like what we see from Tycon, maybe 240. Is It's just my guess. I don't know what it'll come in. I think WLTP is high 200s, like 285, somewhere around there. So EPA will come in below that. Um, so yeah, great seating position, drive mode switch, start stop right there. You have your button to get out of the door, which is this little thing right there. Alyssa can show you. There you go. And it all seems great. You also have this insane sound system, which we'll get, we're going to talk to the actually one of the engineers on the sound system because this car won sound system of the year based off of some rating agency in Europe that I've, I'm not familiar with. So what do you think about that, Alyssa? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, well, they it's say you have like 22 speakers or something in the high 20s. So what's interesting is uh, we just did 1,200 miles, now 1,500 miles in this car's, I would say, closest competitor, which is no longer on sale, but the Polestar One. It's a very rare car, and we're very lucky enough to have one. But it's a two plus two grand tour, a lot of electrification, big sound system, good driver assistance, and we did what that car is built for. We drove it out from Colorado to here in Pebble Beach. I feel like this almost takes that same ethos and just moves it full battery electric, high voltage, fast charging. And I really don't feel like anything's going to be given up here over the Polestar 1, Alyssa. No. I mean, I, it, it is very just like similar feeling. I just see Walter back there and then he's not there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, that's right. Okay. So let's get into some tech stuff because of course an electric car needs a good software uh, to support it. So we have... First off, my car, which will give us uh, perform service zero kilometers. So it's just not, uh, you know, tuned for everything yet. But if we come here to electric vehicle, we have power flow. So it will show us your instant consumption, your motors and your battery, uh, your motor, sorry, and your climate system in terms of power draw. We have our driving history, which has been reset. You have uh, schedules of when you want the car to charge and uh, precondition. We have some charge settings, so you can choose how much AC charging power you want from low to high. And I assume each one of these correlates with a certain amperage. So high could be 80 amps, four could be 60, three could be you know 48. I don't know what it'll be, but that would be my guess. Um, and if we come over here, yep. Yeah, if you just keep tripping breakers, basically it says just set your AC charging to a lower level. I'm sure in the manual, it says what each one of these are. We don't necessarily need to get into that right now. Um, you can go to DC charge. You have two different options, optimized charging, and it says it can optimize battery performance over its lifetime. We've seen these types of optimization uh, charging or these eco-friendly charging from Mercedes, from Porsche, now from Maserati. I think it's a great idea if you plug it into a charger. Sometimes cars charge too fast. You're not in a rush. The station isn't busy and you just don't want to you know, jam all that energy into the battery. Well, you certainly can do that. There's also a super fast option i love that and uh, that's really good now i believe they claim 20 minutes from 10 to 80 percent on this big battery is what i've heard not a hundred percent sure um yeah super fast to allow maximum dc charging uh power capabilities so that is really great uh, love that i would leave mine probably an optimized 99 percent of the time unless i was going a, a big big charge. Now they recommend an 80% daily charge for this vehicle, uh, but you can of course go up to a hundred. Interesting that you can just choose between the two one, uh, these two options rather than setting a slider. I'd also, as a suggestion, like to see a storage option because a lot of Maserati owners are going to go away on vacation or leave this car at their second or third or fourth home. And it'd be great to just have like a 30% storage level that you can you can go to so just some recommendations there from my side um, some more things to show you in here as well you have your three electric motor power outputs each are capable of 335 horsepower like i mentioned um, did i mention that i think i may have gotten kilowatt and horsepower mixed up at the beginning of this video so uh, we'll just shut climate off there we don't need it running so yeah, three, six, 900 and something thousand horsepower, but of course it can only do 700 maximum. So that's a very interesting, again, your three motors right there, torque management. You can see where the power is coming from, 
really great to see. 400 kilowatts of regen in this vehicle, by the way. That is the same as Hummer EV. And what I don't know is if it can do it through ABS, but I imagine it would. So that Tycon regens at 265 roughly kilowatts, maybe 295 on some of the newer software is kind of what I've heard. Um, Tesla will do mid 200 kilowatt regen range, maybe just touching high 200s under extreme situations. This is almost double the amount of regen of those vehicles. That's insane. So again, some of the cool tech coming in here, I'm very excited about. There's also a drag racing mode, if you will, that just counts your, uh, you know, your, your times, your braking distances, your accelery, acceleration stuff, and you get your temperatures right here. So you have your battery level, your battery average temperature, and your 12 volt situation love all of this you can see you can set your torque vectoring control your traction control uh, you can turn stiff suspensions on or off i imagine there's still going to be some changes here to come and then i'm not sure what this performance optimizer does it says optimized for high performance accelerations or optimized for high performance drives and lap times. So I imagine this controls the preconditioning of the battery pack. The max boost will probably heat up the battery pack. So you have less resistance for maximum uh, output and endurance will actually pre-cool and chill the system so you can have more duration while driving. I love to see these options. It really gives me confidence in Maserati for the first time, truly just confidence in general, but it shows me they understand what they're doing, which is really awesome. Uh, other little things in here, just to show you the glove box, little actuator right there. The world's slowest glove box apparently comes out. So you have some shipping stuff. This car is an Italian Euro spec vehicle. Um, all of that is great. Some other settings in here, daytime, nighttime, driver assistance stuff. They actually have a hybrid electric <laughs> menu. I assume a lot of these little pre-production things are going to be uh, yeah, adjusted at some point. Very cool. Air suspension with active damper, of course. And the one thing I'm really curious about is it's a Euro spec, so the nav probably won't work here. I don't know if it's going to have route planning. Yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah, you can see it's been all over Europe. It thinks it's in, yeah, thinks it's in Italy. <laughs> the car has no idea where it is. Um, but I'm actually thinking, are these previous charging stops or previous places it's been? Oh, yeah. So these are all of the places it's been, I guess. That's very interesting. Anyway, you have a clock up here. This is totally customizable. You can change the different uh, things up there from a compass to a power graph, all of that great stuff. To actually put it in gear, I don't know. I think you would probably use the paddle shifters to go drive and park, similar to like the old F1 style. So I think this can also control your regen, but I'm not seeing like a drive neutral reverse the stock this wiper and that's turn signal so it's got to be the paddle shifters to get it out of park we'll have to wait to see until we drive it um yeah as expected fairly shallow center console here because battery pack is there i'm actually surprised the cup holder is this deep our polestar one uses a similar battery centric concept here with a much shallower um pulse uh, uh cup holder little little compartments here and there it looks like a wireless phone charger in there as well um Alyssa, can i have you do a back seat review sure sure okay i'll pop out i'll grab the camera let's shut the car off there we go um i will swap around with Alyssa. let me come this way i'm gonna hand you the microphone Beautiful. there you go thank you there we go <laughs> All right, Alyssa, why don't you give us the back seat review? See if you can figure out how to get in there on first glance. Okay, so you have that little thing. Seat that moves, moves forward. Already. Yeah. Yep, just like uh, Polestar 1. A lot faster than the Polestar 1. <laughs> the Polestar 1 has like buttons that you have to hold. I also love how we're comparing it to something you really can't buy. <laughs> yeah. It's got cup holders back here. It's a true 2 plus 2. Mm -hmm. Nice Myers Manx hat, by the way. Thank you. And here we go. <laughs> so just for reference, I'm 5'10", but I probably leg length is six foot. <laughs> I can put the seat up. Yeah. But can you fit in the front? Yeah, so, so explain to everyone what you're feeling back there for, first, and then I'll sit up front. I mean, overall, this is way more comfortable. I will compare again to the Polestar one. I do not fit back there whatsoever. My head touches the top, and I have a hat on, so this is extra room and this is super comfortable i could actually sit back here and not complain the whole time 
And there's also some little cup holders back here. There's two. And there's also USB and USB-A ports, which is really great. So this is, they really did think about what a backseat person would need in order to sit back here. So it is a very usable space. There's actually a little hook here for you to put your dry cleaning. Um, and what is this? To the trunk. To the trunk. Yeah. I mean, this is nice. It's very comfortable. I enjoy it. Great. It's not bad. So you have leg room there. I do have leg room. Okay, I'm going to go to where you feel like you don't have leg room. Okay. That would be no. Okay, so that's maximum. Yeah. Leg, so you you can still sit with your legs straight there. Right, yeah, because if you can kind of come in and see if you put the seat up a little bit more. They have it curved back here, so it actually makes more room for my knees versus it just being flat. So that actually, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's a great design for people to actually sit in the back. Can you sit in the front? Oh yeah, I fit great. Nice. It is a two plus two. It is a two plus two. All right, so why don't you pop yourself out of there? Go buddy, go. <laughs> <laughs> nice stuff, back seat review, great job. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> we'll switch back. Okay. Well, that is truly a two plus two. You can easily fit back there. Well, there you guys go. That's the interior of the car. Really nice interior and like not super ostentatious, which I think is great. Uh, let's just take a look at trunk space. You have a camera back here, of course. You have uh, the Euro Italian plate that this thing runs on. So if you ever see spy photos, that's this 12 volt in the trunk. You have your type two connection which is great with your uh, your red plug. These are what these guys use, 12 volt uh, battery to keep it topped up. All good stuff back here. Again, we showed you the 12 volt there, the uh, charging port. The one last thing is I'm gonna insert some B-roll of under the hood. Again, it's a pre-production car, but everything looks pretty normal under there. There's no front trunk. They have the front motor up there, some extra cooling. And because again, it's a combustion and an electric car in one, it kind of makes sense that there's no front trunk or anything like that. It is a slight compromise until we get these full battery electric versions from Maserati, probably coming closer to the end of this decade. Um, but it seems like they really went all out for this thing. You have a roof mounted uh, satellite antenna and actually camera back here. So you'll have the digital rear view mirror, which is great. Everything about this car just has one upped my original expectations when I heard Maserati was building an electric car. There's one last thing I want to do, which is just interview one of the sound system guys, because it sounds like this truly has an incredible sound system. So we'll talk to them and then we'll end the video. Raf, how's it going, sir? Yeah, everything is fine. Thank you. I sure. love this car. Amazing car. <laughs> <laughs> so can you explain what you do, what your company is and how you've integrated the sound system into the uh, Gran Turismo? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Essentially, we, the name of the company is Sonus Faber, that is uh, a Latin name that means uh, artisan of sound. It's an Italian com uh, company completely based uh, in Italy. And basically for core business, we did this kind of, of toy for, for boy, you know? Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> this is a special edition for, for the Folgore version with special Rame Folgore, that is the the paint of, of the car, and also the front panel made by Econil, the same material of the seats of that you will find inside the Folgore version. So we basically, what we did, what Maserati asked to do is to replicate the same high quality sound that we are famous in the world for, and implementing that sound inside a car cabin. So huge work to, done together with, uh, with Maserati, implementing a 19 speaker inside this car, and we are really, really happy and hope, uh, also proud to say that this is the best in-car sound system for this year, nominated by ASA Award. Uh, so in the door, you will find the same structure that you can find there because you have a three-way channel with a tweeter, mid-range and woofer. Also, in the center channel, you will have other additional two speakers right above there air on the roof, additional other two. Uh, this is uh, made for creating uh, the left channel of the seats and the right channel for, for the other seats. So basically all is studied to offer the much higher quality possible inside this car. 
for sure we implemented the, all the new technologies like the 2D surround and 3D surround and also the media expander that is this algorithm that improves this, the inputs that you have uh, to plug in inside the car. And this is one of the first big audio contracts that you guys have gotten because you mentioned you did a couple one-offs with Pagani. You've done some of their cars, which is like the top of the top, yeah. <laughs> crazy, but yeah. you know, only a few cars a year yeah. versus yeah. here, a series production model. What were some of the challenges of working with, you know, such a high volume situation for yeah. your specialty business? This is yeah. considered high volume. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, but, you know, let's say that uh, the, the initial phases are pretty the same. We operate together with the car company to have this kind of compromising between uh, the positioning of the speaker, that it's right, very the, the most important thing in, uh, inside the car cabin, and also the dimension of that. As you can see, we have a huge dimension inside, inside the car. So basically the creation process is quite the same. The Pagani one was more handmade car as, as the car itself. This one is a more uh, an engineering process, a lot of works before the creation of the final version of the car. But at the end, uh, the, the philosophy is the same. We have to consider that uh, we, have, uh, we are famous in the world for that kind of product. So it's really a learning process uh, to have than these kind of things. And just one last question for you, something we briefly spoke about off camera was, you know, you had to build a sound system to handle a battery electric platform yeah. as well as a combustion platform. Yeah. And with battery electric, you have much more stable voltages going to yeah. your sound system. Yeah. Whereas with electric, if you do a quick rev of the engine or a quick downshift, you have voltage spikes. And so what, what was that process like engineering both? Yo, uh, yes, with, with very few words, this is a work that is done by the amplifiers, that is completely hide uh, inside the trunk, between the wheel and, and the trunk, and basically he analyzes the power that it's, it's needed for the sound system and adapt to have always a flat power for, for the sound system. So no spike, no yeah, anymore. But Doesn't ideally, it? the perfect platform would be electric if you're doing car audio. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because electrical have uh, always the same power, so it's more stable. It's more an easy job for our amplifier. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the story. I can't wait to sample this. If there's ever an opportunity for our audience to find one of these, listen to the sound system. I'm about to have a go. And then we'll, of course, wrap up the video. Thanks for all the information, Rob. appreciate it. Thank you. Let's start with with, uh, with this truck and uh, maybe first of all uh, have uh, an experience like a real uh, audio file. <laughs> yeah, the 2D, uh, so turn all that off. Without yeah. any helping uh, for our uh, system. So oh, trainer. what does tuning mode do? The tuning mode is another uh, uh, little thing that we did uh, with, with Maserati. Basically, these two names uh, are uh, the names of our core system. Okay. And uh, all, every of these uh, systems have a specific uh, uh, signature sound in sound, you know? Mm -hmm. So we replaced that signature inside the car. So a really fan of Sonos Faber can find the same sound of their system inside this car. So can you order that as an option with your car? Uh, this system, that that one, yeah, the, yeah the absolutely. Okay. In future, the, the the customer when the car will be available can choose to have also an Amati. The name of that speaker, that speaker is Amati, mm -hmm. the most famous violinist, uh, with the same exterior color and the same uh, Econil that you have. Oh, so you can match the spec. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. is such a uh, you know supercar owner thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. is the sound system standard or is it optional equipment? Yeah, it's standard in every Gran Turismo. Mode, the, the premium version mm -hmm. and you can choose to have uh, the high premium version with more speakers uh, as an option this yeah. is the high premium system. and so you would recommend go full full on the sound system absolutely yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hell yeah well okay. we won't be able to show our audience what it sounds like because of course the iphone mic won't do any help and yeah. we would get copyrighted so yeah. i'll have a listen and then give an impression afterwards <laughs> <laughs> so media expander off and there you guys go the Maserati Gran Turismo Fulgore. Again, I came in with expectations with Maserati of old in my head, where they were just known for their engine sound and truly not much else. But honestly, after experiencing this and having a go with this sound system and the, the expansive cabin and learning about this 400 kilowatt regen, all this torque vectoring logic, all I'm saying is it just has me a little bit more excited 
about Maserati's electric feature. Again, if you're a true car enthusiast, the thought of an electric Maserati probably doesn't resonate very well with you. But with me, after experiencing the car, if this was parked next to the three liter turbo V6 option, again, without driving them, I'm not, I'm not sure that V6 is really what I'd want in one of these things. I think I would go for the Fulgore, even with being a combustion car enthusiast. This just seems to fit the bill for what this car was engineered for. I can't wait for the future versions of uh, Maseratis to become electrified and fully electric, of course. We'll be testing them as they come out. And um, all I can say is I wasn't expecting much and I truly am impressed here. Everything is looking and feeling great with this car. So thanks so much for watching another Out of Spec Reviews video. We'll see you on another one soon. <laughs> it's all good. Bye-bye. <laughs>